the world is going through changes. Changes happening at a speed that we have never seen before. This is leading to disruption, chaos, panic, fear, hysteria, and a turbulent economy and marketplace. How do you protect your wealth in a turbulent world? How do you invest for cash flow in alternative assets to escape the rat race in times of uncertainty? How do you decentralize yourself, your family, your community, your business, and your investments to become sovereign and escape the matrix? If you are looking for strategies, tactics, and techniques to escape the rat race and matrix, you are in the right place. My name is MC Lobsher, and this is Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobsher. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode and spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. There's three shows, Cashflow Ninja, Cashflow Investing Secrets, and Reset Investing Secrets at CashflowNinja.com, along with books, uh, a newsletter, and a mastermind that you can sign up for. Everything at CashflowNinja.com. I've got a fantastic show for you today. I'm joined by Jordan Berry. Jordan, it's great to have you on the show. Oh my goodness. Thank you for having me. It's such a huge honor and uh, a little bit surreal to just be on this show. So I appreciate it. <laughs> no, fantastic. Um, for folks that um, don't um, know about you and your background, can you please share a little bit uh, with them and what you're up to these days? Give a, give a little background and, and what, what you're up to these days. Yeah. 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 So for about 15 years, I was a pastor and uh, I was working at churches and stuff. And Got to a point, I had a couple of young kids and, you know, just the demands of, you know, working with people and all that stuff were just, you know, it's time for a little break. So I decided to uh, move out of doing that vocationally and was looking for the next thing. But I had an education in ministry and all my experiences in ministry. And then the big question is, well, what do you do when you don't want to be in ministry as a job anymore? And uh, so I had a great idea and it was, you know, we live in Southern California here. We had a house. I was like, let's rent out our house. We got two young kids. Let's take the money we have saved up. Let's buy a condo on the beach in Hawaii and let's go live in Hawaii doing sort of whatever over there until our kids are school aged. And then we can move back if we want to and that gang condo in Hawaii. And my wife said we could do that or we could buy a laundromat. And we ended up buying a laundromat and not moving to Hawaii. We still don't own anything in Hawaii uh, yet. Um, but uh, we ended up buying a laundromat. And the the concept behind that was we were looking for, you know, something that could bring us cash flow uh, with, you know, that was divorced from our our time input, right? We, we didn't want a one-to-one -one time input uh, for our cash flow. So that was the concept behind it. Uh, however, it did not go well. And uh, we bought the wrong laundromat the wrong way. And, you know, the broker who was selling us the laundromat was like, look how much money you're going to make and showed us a sweet pro forma that got us super excited. And we ended up losing a couple thousand dollars a month for a, a long time until we figured out a lot of very expensive, very emotionally taxing lessons. Uh, so that's sort of the, uh, the intro into the story there is where we were kind of randomly ended up in the laundromat business and have been there ever since that was seven years ago, eight years ago. And now you've, you've, you have a laundromat empire with uh, passive, <laughs> passive cash flow businesses and semi-passive <laughs> cash flow businesses. And you've built a community around it, podcast and, a whole bunch of stuff, right? It's crazy how the world works. It is funny. And, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, you never see your life going in this direction. But yeah, I, I decided, you know, I got to that pivotal point where it's like, okay, I've learned some very expensive lessons. I can either sort of, you know, cut bait and go a different direction, or I can push on and, you know, finish my quote unquote education and, uh, you know, I ended up going that direction. And then I was like, you know what? Nobody needs to learn the lessons I learned in getting into this business the way that I learned them. 
I can just share. And so that turned into a blog. The blog turned into a YouTube. And then I was like, well, if I really want to know how to run this business well, I should talk to the people who are running the business well, right? So that turned into a podcast where I interview laundromat owners and industry professionals um, and just ask them their secrets to success in this business. And it's been awesome ever since. We've got a community, like you said, and a, you know, a lot going on. So it's fun. It's fun. There's a lot of parallels. So uh, it's, 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 you know, um, you get to a point, right? When you start and you take action, um, you run into some resistance and very hard lessons, stuff that you can't learn in a book, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and there's two roads that people will go down. They'll either say, this doesn't work. Laundry bed businesses suck. This is totally not for me. Same with real estate, by the way. And pick yeah, your absolutely. asset clause. You know, they just say, this isn't for me. They lose money, they cut their losses, and they move on move on to something else. Or they just go back to what they were doing before. And then the other uh, road, the road less traveled, is like, let's figure this out. Let's figure this out. Let's let's turn this around. Let's take these lessons and these knocks that we, that we got. And now we're going to figure out how to do this correctly. And then eventually we share it with other people. And then I love the fact that you then, you know, st stayed a guy too you know, with your podcast and interviewing successful people, that's kind of, you know, when you were uh, sharing the story, I'm like, that's my story, basically. I ran, I ran into all these issues. I tried to figure it out. I shared it. And then I'm like, well, if I really want to elevate what I'm doing, I have to talk to the best minds in business and investing and learn more from all these cash flow ninjas that I get to, get to interview. So it's a pretty, pretty cool backstory. Yeah. Well, and, you know, just, this is very cool, but when we when I bought that first laundromat, it was a big time fixer upper. We call them zombie mats. I spent a lot of time in at night fixing that thing up myself, listening to podcasts and guess which is one of the big podcasts I listen to, which is this podcast uh, that you know that you've been hosting since I probably around 2016 or so. I was early, yeah. early on in your your podcast that I was listening. So very cool to be on here too, and a little bit of a full circle moment here. Uh, for me, but so cool. And I appreciate everything that you've done, you know, for me and, you know, for so many other people in hosting the podcast. So I know you're benefiting from talking to these, you know, minds in, in investing, uh, but the rest of us get to listen in and, and benefit too. So I appreciate that. No, that's awesome. I really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I, I started the podcast early 2016. It's kind of crazy how time flies yeah. when you're, when you're, when you're having fun. Um, so t talk to me a little bit about the laundromat business and the kind of the industry what what do we need to know what's go, what's going on there what does the landscape look like why yeah. would people why would people be interested in it and why uh have you know there are people that once they find that niche they never leave they're like this is it <laughs> yeah well listen this is the right podcast beyond because it it's cash flow right yep. and the the cash flow of a laundromat and especially for the amount of effort, like, like you kind of alluded to it being semi-passive, that's, you know, more accurate than passive, right? It, I, yep. I always joke, like whenever you have a bunch of people and you have a bunch of machines, you're going to have a bunch of problems, right? And laundromats are full of people and machines. So you got problems to deal with, you got some stuff to do, but it's very minimal, especially when it comes to, you know, running a business. Um, so w what I love about laundromats is that the, like a, an average run of the mill base hit laundromat deal, you're looking at a 20 to 25% return on your money unleveraged. So before any loans or anything like that. Um, and that is just a recipe for growing your cash flow quickly, right? When you apply some leverage to that, those numbers go up even. And you have it's a mom and pop industry. And so there's a lot of opportunities to add value there, increase your cash flow. You can add a service side to the business. You know, it's really a business that's surprisingly versatile uh, in in the way that you can run it because you can run it semi passively. But I've got a lot of buddies who have legit laundromat empires where they own forty plus laundromats, or they have a. I got a buddy who's doing a pickup and delivery that does more than three million dollars a year of pickup and delivery laundry residential, and uh, so there's a lot of different ways to run this business. You can, you know, run it passively. You can run it actively. You can grow it big. You can keep it small. Uh, it's a very versatile business. So, but I think the thing that attracts people is 
how little effort it takes and how much cash flow you can make. Yeah. And I think like the, um, you know, for f- folks that are listening to, there are a ton of business owners and investors that are very systems orientated. And when you can implement and execute these systems, and once you have that up and up and running, and you, let's just say, have a manager that mm-hmm. goes to the site from time to time or is on site, I mean, it it really, uh, like you said, it's it's a it's a very semi passive business. Yeah, and you know, right now, so I I joke a lot, but it's not really a joke. But for decades, laundromats look the same, and that is top load machines. They're old, they're dark, they're dingy, they're dirty. You don't really want to hang out. I mean, it's got a bad reputation. I'll just I'll just put it out there. Laundromat industry has a bad reputation for for being sort of places you don't really want to hang out. However. That mindset is shifting a lot. People are starting to see, hey, if I take care of my customers, I'm going to make a lot more money. I can charge more. More people are going to come. They're going to enjoy the experience. They're going to share that experience with other people. And so that's definitely starting to shift now. But the other cool thing that's happening that hasn't happened before is that there's a lot of technology being introduced. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was we were, We've been in the dark ages for decades until maybe around the last like three, four years even. Um, where there's digital payment systems now. And, you know, that allows you to own multiple locations and not have to carry around bags full of quarters get heavy real fast. I'll tell you that. Um, So having the digital payment systems where you can remote start machines and different ways to monitor the business, different software that's available now uh, to help you manage your business. So all of that is making it even more attractive for you know, investors and a lot of real estate investors, when they hear the cash flow numbers of laundromats, they're like, yes, but they don't want to spend a ton of time managing a laundromat, right? So this technology that's coming in now is making it even more attractive to uh, people in this industry to, uh, you know, come partake in the cash flow uh, that's available right now. It reminds me a lot of the mobile home park industry when I looked into it like 15 years ago, like you just said, Mm -hmm. mom and pops, uh, not very desirable, uh, like the locations, right? People don't want to hang out there. It's got kind of like a like a, a reputation about it, just like the mobile home park, you know, uh, b- yep. business head, you know, cause everybody thinks there's a cousin Eddie in every park, right? <laughs> From the National Lampoons. Yep. So, but this brings an enormous, op- enormous opportunity. So just like the mobile home park industry, I feel like we're almost at that point for laundromats back, you know, where we are now, there's an enormous opportunity. So share, if you could share a little bit more about the business model of it, mm-hmm. um, what what makes a great laundromat business? Yeah, so it's a good question. Uh, it's a little difficult because there's a lot of different business models. Like I said, there's a lot of versatility on how you can run it. So it kind of depends. I mean, it goes back to, this is the same with any investment, any business, right? Is you need to start with your like, what are you trying to get out of this? Why are you doing it? Uh, and what result are you looking for? Right. And if you're, resu- you know, if the result you're looking for is some, some passive income to add to your portfolio, you know, you're probably running a self-service laundry, uh, you know, mostly, and a, you know, a great self-service laundry is a, a laundromat that's in a great location, right? Real estate location, 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 laundromat, it's at least as important, the location, you can't really move a laundromat. So if you pick the wrong location, you're just kind of out of luck. You need a lot of infrastructure to make a a laundromat work. And so you're just kind of going to be out of luck there. And, uh, you know, so you want a good location, you know, you're looking for a certain demographic for self-serve laundry. That's going to be, um, you know, people who are, at or below median income. Usually it's usually renters, um, that you're looking for there. You know, families are great because we all know kids are disgusting creatures and, you know, create a lot of laundry. So, uh, you know, bigger households are, are good. So you're looking for neighborhoods like that and, uh, you want to be visible. You want to have parking, all of those things. Um, but that's what makes for a good location. And then when you're actually valuing and evaluating a laundromat, they're, the value is based on the cash flow, right? It's not based on how much the machines are worth or anything like that. It's based on the cash flow. And so really what's cool about buying a laundromat is that unless you're buying one that's a complete fixer-upper and you know it's not making money, 
um, you are buying cash flow and that, you know, that cash flow is from day one, right? And then you have the opportunity to improve that cash flow, obviously. So, so that's for that. If if you're looking to maybe build an empire, you want to build a business, which a lot of times what happens is people get in wanting the cash flow and wanting it to be passive, get hooked on it, and then sort of are like, well, what if I built a big business here and you know built an empire? And so they sometimes you can add like a service side where people can drop off their laundry where you know you can do pickup and delivery and actually go pick it up from from customers and deliver it back clean um, and those obviously are slightly dim, different demographics where they're higher income you know and you want to be in sort of those neighborhoods dual income neighborhoods um, you know white collar neighborhoods typically uh, will utilize that service so you know those are some of the things that I mean there's a lot of things that go into it but those are some of the big things that you're looking for to find a good laundromat in a good location. Um, and then again, you're just looking at the cash flow and, you know, valuing it based on that. I want to take a moment to share something very important right now. Are you trying to figure out how to protect your savings from the banking collapse, which has already started, and the coming financial crisis? Most banks will fail. Deposits that are not insured by the FDIC will be lost and there will be bank bail-ins. And this collapse in the banking system will lead to chaos in the financial system. Banks also provide loans to real estate investors. So what do you think is going to happen to lending in the event of a banking and a financial crisis? You can be proactive and position your savings to protect it and also have access to it to use it to buy discounted assets by positioning it in your own banking system through the infinite banking concept strategy. Producers Wealth has put together a presentation at yourownbankingsystem.com where you will learn how to position capital outside of the banking system and the Wall, Wall Street casino, just like the ultra wealthy, to protect it and create a pool of tax-free liquid capital to capitalize on the massive opportunity to buy discounted assets, which is coming. You can access the presentation at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. I, I appreciate that you shared it all depends what you want your life to look like, number one, what your vision is. And then one of the most important things in business, regardless of what asset class it is, is who are you going to serve? And it seems like that is very important to know that right up front because um, you know, you get cus customers and clients that buy from Nordstrom, that buy from Target and buy from Walmart. They all buy shirts, they all buy different shirts. All three of these stores make money selling shirts, but there's very different ex expectations and levels of service in all three of these stores. So it seems like that's kind of very, very important where if you have a business model that is very just um, not a lot of humans involved in machines, I mean, which is very, very doable. Uh, I was just traveling recently in, and through an airport, I think it was like Nashville airport. I just saw this one completely like, humanless store there where you basically have to uh, scan a credit card just to get in and then it's kind of self-checkout and then you're out and i looked at that and i'm like wow that's i mean it's basically like a parking garage these days right yeah so but yeah, you yeah. could do the same thing essentially um uh, with uh a a laundromat where people can get in a certain way whether it's a, a you know a card they could get in a, a same thing, like not, no quarters or actual physical cash to use mm -hmm. all of the machines in there. I'm assuming a lot of them are switching over. And then you could sell ancillary stuff through vending machines uh, mm -hmm. for some cash flow in there too. Um, that's going to be much more hands-off than a pickup and drop-off kind of delivery service that uh, cater, as you mentioned, to very busy, uh, you know, dual-income families, Um you know, high income earners in, in other specific neighborhoods, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And there's, I think there's just a lot of opportunities right now with laundromats in terms of being innovative is not a, 
we're not known for being an innovative industry, but there's more and more innovation starting to happen here. So it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. And all of that comes down to, you know, these things being, you know, you think about a laundromat, like all people have laundry. Like what one thing we saw in the last, you know, couple of years is that laundromats are essential and they've been essential before it was cool. Uh, but they were actually deemed essential pretty much all over the place because people have to do laundry and you have to do laundry on some sort of regular rhythm. Right. And so it makes it a recurring income business and, you know, people get into a habit. And so, Hey, you see the same customers Tuesday morning, nine o'clock, they come every week, you know, and once they're your customer, you really got to do something to lose them. As a so they're just very stable, solid businesses. They're relatively predictable. Um, and you know, they weather a lot of storms, you know, come recession, whatever people still need clean clothes, right? They don't need dry clean clothes, maybe if they're not going to work, but they still need washed clothes. Um, and so they just, there's just so many good things to be excited about. I just get so excited. <laughs> yeah. What's the competition like too? Cause it seems back to my previous comment that this is kind mm -hmm. of like mobile home parks 15 years ago. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. And you know, I mean, listen, I, I hate that this is true, but the answer to all of your questions is it depends. Yeah, uh, so no, I know. <laughs> yeah, but but I try to I try to at least clarify what it depends on, right? So, it, I mean, it does depend. Like, I'm here in L.A., and L.A. competition is high. There is a lot of competition. There's a lot of laundromats. However, there are not a lot of very good laundromats. There's a lot of what we call zombie mats, right? And those are the dark, dingy, half the machines out of order, you know, homeless person sleeping in the back kind of laundromats. And so on the one hand, there can be a lot of competition. On the other hand, if you're running, if you, if you professionalize your laundromat, so to speak, and you're, you know, you're running it like it's a, like it's a professional business, right? And you're treating your customers, right? You're keeping everything clean. You're keeping all your machines working, you know, just some of these basic things you'd think are obvious, but that people don't do. I don't, I don't know, but um, then it's not that difficult to rise above the competition. And one thing that's just starting to come into this industry that has not been a part of our industry really is marketing, right? And so it's a huge opportunity if you come in, have a business that's treating customers well, that's you know keeping everything working, and then you throw a marketing engine on top of that. There's very few laundromats doing that right now. And it's a huge, huge opportunity uh, to really grow your business really quickly. Yeah. So um, if we're going to go out and look for a, a laundromat, right? You've mentioned location, location, location. First, well, first you want to figure out what your life wants to look like, you know, before you go into this, your vision, then you want to figure out who you want to serve, what type of business model kind of, and then location, location. What are some of the other things that we need to take a look at, you know, when we go out, explore, you know, potential laundromats, um, or sites for laundromats. And that will be a follow-up question to buy as is mom and pop versus build too. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it depends. I'll just start them all with it. it depends. Yeah. Right? Again, it depends on what you're looking for. Uh, but I mean, generally what you're looking for is you want a place that's, all you need to do really is put yourself in the, in the shoes of the customer, right? And our, our typical customer is, is like a mom with her kids, and, you know, if you can put yourself in those shoes and say, okay, I'm a mom with kids and I want to go do my laundry. Am I going to go to this laundromat? Right. So you want a place that's clean. You want a place that's safe, you know, having the wrong people hanging out out front or inside the, in the laundromat, it's, you know, it's not going to make a mom with kids feel safe. Right? right. So you want a place that's clean. You want a place that's safe. You want a place where, you know, Things are things are working the way they should be. Um, you know, you want lights that all that all the lights work. Like that's very simple, but there's like a lot of places where they don't all work. Um, but again, if you're coming in for a value add opportunity, it's a little different. Um, but you know, you just you want you want those basic things kind of taken care of and and you want to kind of assess the neighborhood and see what kind of neighborhood is this. Because if you're going into a rougher neighborhood, those laundromats actually can be more profitable. But you're also going to deal with more headaches, right? More problems, people vandalizing your property. Uh, you might be in a struggle with, 
you know, people come in to just hang out and drink in your laundromat and you have to police that, uh, you know, so there's, there's all these kind of gives and takes there. And again, going back to what do you want your life to look like and what do you want, um, you know, what do you want the business to look like? Um, those will help, help you help guide you in, in making those decisions. Um, and with all that said too, sometimes you can go into those opportunities and, you know, implement some management practices and implement some technology to help you clear those issues out. And if you can solve, this is the same as real estate, right? If you can yeah. solve somebody else's problems, you can actually make a ton of money, right? If you can come in and uh, an owner's fed up because people are, are in their laundromat drinking and you're like, well, I'm going to go put, you know, cameras in there and then uh, a speaker to where I can sit on my couch watching the game check the camera. And if somebody's in there, I can actually speak to them and say, Hey, get out. I just called the police. And all of a sudden that problem's not a problem anymore. So people are coming like, if you can solve their problem, then you have a really good situation on your hand where you can make a lot of money. Right. Right. So very, very similar to the real, the real estate kind of thinking, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, you, you need to figure out what, what part of the pool or what uh, at what end of the pool you want to play at. Because they're all going to come with different problems too. I can imagine that there is logistical stuff that is going to be headaches when you do like a pickup and drop off uh, service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And that I mean, you know, that's it's almost a different business. Like if you're yep. if you're doing a pickup and deliver, it's almost a different business. You're just utilizing the same assets, which is part of what makes it so great and so profitable. Because you can start a pickup and delivery business, do fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month. Uh, and you don't have to buy any new assets because your self-serve customers are paying for your washers and dryers uh, that you're utilizing. So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of power in that. And then if you can come in and solve those problems too, you know, the logistical problems, the driving the routes, all that stuff, you can come in and solve those problems. You're in pretty good shape, I think. Are you seeing a lot of people uh, building their own laundromats too versus just buying existing locations from mom and pop owners? Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely a lot of people building. Um, however, this is a pretty mature business, right? And so when there's new communities being built, there's new laundromats being built and yep. there's infill laundromats being built too. However, what happens with a lot of Laundromats is it's very expensive to build. Um, and depending on what, you know, you're, I don't know, here in California, we make everything difficult in California here when it comes to business. So buildings, yep. very costly, labor's very costly, permits are very costly and time consuming, you know, those kinds of things, right? So uh, people are building for sure. Um, however, a lot of times it just makes more sense to go buy an existing one and totally redo it. Um, but it, it, again, it depends. Uh, because the business model is also shifting to bigger laundromats, more square footage, more machines. Um, and so some of these like super centers, these laundry processing centers that are just, you know, bohemus are, are popping up now and they're, you know, they're nice, they're new, they're big. And they're almost like the Walmarts of, uh, of laundromats there. And, uh, you know, those require ground up builds a lot of times because they just, weren't like that in the past. Yeah. What type of financing is generally available in this, this industry? Is it a lot, obviously a lot of uh, cash payments, a lot of maybe seller financing if there's mom and pops, but what other financing is available for buyers in this space? Yeah. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned seller financing because, you know, that's sort of the, the mythical unicorn of investors, right? Everybody's looking for seller financing. Well, it turns yep. out seller financing is pretty common in this business. Uh, like I said, a lot of mom and pops. However, the reason for that is because a lot of laundromats, I kind of joke a lot about laundromat owners being either really, really bad at keeping the books. I've literally gotten P and L's handed to me a profit and loss statements on napkins, handwritten, literally, um, <laughs> or it's laundromat true. owners tend to be like really, really good at keeping the books. Like, like maybe they have even more than one book potentially nudge, nudge, right. Right? and so those obstacles make it tough sometimes to get them financed because uh, banks don't like when there's no books and books don't, or banks don't like when there's multiple sets of books. 
Um, and so, uh, so they can be tricky. Some of them can be tricky to finance. However, a lot of times you can get bank loans, even SBA uh, loans here in you know in America, and uh, and so there are financing. And then there's also laundromat specific lenders um, that will finance. Now, typically they require more of a down payment than maybe we're used to in real estate. You know, I invest in real estate too. Um, you know. Right now, they're looking for 35 to 40 percent down on laundromats. Um, you know, now is kind of a crazy time when it comes to lending, sort of in general. Yeah, uh, but they're looking for a little bit higher down payment um, for that. Um, but the other good thing is that you know, equipment is not cheap, um, but there are great equipment financing options, um, and a lot of times you can finance equipment 100 percent financing. Um, you can amortize it over, you know, seven to 10 years. A lot of times they'll give you a few months, uh, no payments. And then, you know, some time with interest only payments just to help you build your business up as you, you know, get the new machines in there. So the equipment financing side of things is great. Uh, it makes it very, very attractive to let the business pay for itself. Uh, at that point, you don't have to come out of pocket for that if you don't want to. Yeah, equipment the equipment financing business is great. Uh, we've we've done some business in that space uh, in, in some projects, which leads me to my next question. Just that the equipment financing already, and there's a lot of equipment in there. I mean, mm -hmm. what does the taxes uh, look like? Or th there's great tax benefits yeah. uh, in laundromats, just as there are in uh, real estate. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I think. You know, when it so so you can depreciate, you know, I, I'll start off with I'm not a tax expert, so talk to tax experts, you know, disclaimer. Yep. <laughs> uh, but you know, you can depreciate uh, equipment uh, for sure and and great, almost like a cost segregation you can do um, yep. with with laundromats. And so they turn, turn out to be really, really good um, tax benefits for you. Uh, I still think, in terms of depreciation, real estate has the edge there. Um, but also you can run a lot of your expenses through the business too. you know, take deductions again, not a tax expert, but like home office deductions, lots of expenses you can run through your business, you know, pre-tax and use those as an expense. Um, and then you're paying a lot less tax. And then once you have depreciation on top of that, you know, a lot of times you're paying very little, if any taxes, um, yep. And there are other less savory ways that you can work the tax code, but I actually don't recommend you do those. No, no, you don't tickle the tiger by the nose or the lion right. by the nose. And you it's don't need to. That's what's bite. great about lawn mats. Like I generally, yeah. I mean, they have a reputation of, of that, right. But cause they're a cash business generally speaking. Um, but I, I, I really think that you don't need to do that. And it also devalues your, your laundromat too. So uh, I think, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot when you do those things. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors, Penumbra Solutions. Life Settlements Investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic market and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion-dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. If you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments, Penumbra Solutions at CashflowNinja.com forward slash life settlements. That's CashflowNinja.com forward slash life settlements. The password to access that webinar is Penumbra all lowercase. And that brings me to the other point of investments. You've got great cash flow, great tax benefits. You've got the opportunity to appreciate and force appreciation of an yep. asset through value adds and ancillary income and reducing, you know, overheads and increasing, you know, uh, revenue. And then you've also got the ability to leverage, right? You can leverage yep. Uh, the skill sets, capabilities, uh, capital networks of other folks. I mean, we've already talked about seller financing. That's the capital of other folks. Technology is a big uh, lever right there that you can that you can use. So, 
it checks all four boxes when you look at at, at a great like uh investment play yeah absolutely and you know like you said i mean it 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 hits all those boxes I'll just this might be helpful for for some depending on kind of what they're doing but i'll just kind of do a quick head to head for real estate cuz i'm a real estate investor i love yeah. investing in real estate i'd say in terms of cash flow it's really hard to beat laundromats like with anything and the average real estate deal can't touch the average laundromat deal when it comes to cash flow. So I, that's what I really love. And I, I consider laundromats like a cash flow business. And I think it plays really well with real estate when it comes to uh, taxes. I think real estate has a slight edge, but laundromats are right there. Um, great on the taxes. When it comes to equity, uh, you're able to, uh, force equity, especially with commercial real estate. Um, but equity builds a little bit quicker with, uh, real estate than with laundromats. Um, and that's a function of how they're valued. Right. But that's also yeah. why the cash flow of laundromats is better, um, there. And then when it comes to leverage, I'd say real estate has a slight edge. Um, but again, you can apply, you know, pretty good leverage to laundromats as well. And so that's sort of just a, a stack down of, of how I see them, uh, running. So if it's cash flow you're looking for, and and here's what I here's what I love about laundromats and what I recommend is if your goal is to get out of your nine to five ASAP, create that financial freedom ASAP, I think a vehicle like a laundromat is a great place to start to just get that cash flow built ASAP so that then you can go and build real estate. And that's what I recommend a lot of people do. Um, and it's something that a lot of people overlook because real estate's so much more exciting to me, at least than laundromats. Right. Uh, but if your goal is to get out of that nine to five or build that cash flow financial freedom as quickly as possible, I think laundromats are a great way to go and then start funneling that money into real estate and build that long-term, uh, wealth there. Yeah. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about all different scenarios and different economic environments, when you're in recession, deep recessions, and you're going also in almost in like a depressionary kind of like environment, um, Maslow's hierarchy is your friend mm -hmm. if you're if you're an investor or a business owner. So a lot of people, we get a ton of questions. What's gonna, you know, what's working now? What's gonna work if the economy gets even worse uh for the average person? And I'm like, just go, going back to Maslow's hierarchy, they're going to need a place to stay. They're going to need a place to eat or food. And they're going to, um, I mean, you got to wash your clothes. Clothes right? to wear. Yep. Yep. Clean clothes. It's on there. Yeah. 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 I think and, that's super wise. Yeah. Um, And then the big thing, uh, like, and, and maybe we'll go back to your, the, the first lesson you learned, right? My big question is like, so this is great. I'm like, I really can see the opportunity here. Like I said, it's very, very similar to 15 years ago when I saw in the mobile home park space where if you took action then, whew, I mean, there was a lot of opportunity, which mm -hmm. I get the feeling that this is where it's at right now. Mm -hmm. um, how do you lose money in this business? And again, this is kind of like, what are some of the mistakes that people make? Maybe you can share some of the mistakes that you made because there's probably listeners thinking and viewers, well, why didn't the, your first one work out, right? So yeah. how do how does this go uh, bad pretty quickly? Yeah, so a, a, couple, a couple big lessons that I learned. So number one is when I bought my laundromat, there, there wasn't really a whole lot of information out there. And in fact, the industry was very like protective. It was like almost like a well-kept secret um, yeah. in the industry. And in fact, when I started the podcast, I actually caught a lot of uh, negative feedback from the industry because they felt like I was airing all the secrets and and all that stuff. And, and so it's very much this like closed scarcity mindset um, that was going on. So I didn't, I did as much research as I could, but I really, I relied on the broker that I was working with. And it turned out the broker was just interested in making a commission and sold me something that was not a good fit at the wrong price. Right. So, I mean, number one, I'd say do, do your research and, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of my resources, what, you know, it's a good place to start at least. Um, and I think we have the best information out there. Uh, but there's other places now too that are, are popping up with information, which I love. I think that's great. So do your research because, you know, these are cash businesses. 
And it can be difficult to analyze a cash business because there's not a paper trail really. And a lot of times owners are going to say, here's what a laundromat's making. And then you say, well, can I see your taxes? And either they say no, or they show you something and the numbers are different on their taxes than the numbers they gave you. Right. And so you got to kind of do some groundwork. There's, you've got to sort of layer multiple techniques of verification of income and expenses and determining the trajectory of the laundromat um, in order to appropriately value the laundromat. And if you get the valuation wrong, you don't have to get it wrong by that much. Um, just for example, let's say you, you miss on the valuation by $500 a month, which is probably not going to make or break anybody, but that's $500 a month. Well, not only now are you losing out on $6,000 of cash flow every year, you know, that you thought you were going to be making, but that's, you know, at a four to five times multiple of the net income, which is how a lot of them are valued. That's twenty-four dollars to $30,000 of equity you just lost, of net worth you just lost, just like that. Um, and it's easy to do, right? And so I, I always just recommend, like, even if you're working with a broker or whatever, their priority is to facilitate the deal. And, you know, their, their interests are not tied to your interests necessarily, right? And so right. I always recommend talk to somebody, get somebody involved that knows the business, that can look for red flags for you, that can make sure you're asking the right questions, that can help you verify the income, the expenses, that can help you determine the trajectory. Like this is one of those businesses where you can spend a couple hundred to a couple thousand dollars bringing somebody in to help you, you know, get that right. And it literally would have saved me six figures. I lost six figures in that first deal. Um, and so that's one of the situations where, you know, you're going to, you're going to save yourself a lot of headache, bring in somebody experienced in who's seen the, all, all the things. <laughs> yeah. You could have paid a consultant, you know, let's just throw out a number $5,000, which is, mm -hmm. would, would have saved you, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh yeah. If I could go back, I mean, there weren't really any consultants at the time, but there are now. Right. And like, obviously like I do consulting, I have a team that does consulting, uh, but you know, the, it, I mean, it literally would have shifted the direction of my life. Uh, you know, if I had done, like, it, I can't overstate and, and not, it's not just the money, like just the emotional strain of thinking you're going to be making four to $5,000 a month and losing after I had quit my job and losing a couple thousand dollars a month. And, you know, just the emotional strain, it was on me, the, you know, the, the pain and and the the wedge it, it started to drive between my wife and I because it's just the finance when there's financial stress you know like you I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to this when there's financial stress there's relational stress that's going to happen too and it was it was so hard right and so yeah. um, you know even besides saving the hundred thousand dollars you know would have just saved us a lot of heartache. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff happening, obviously, in that industry. What are some of the things that you're studying and learning right now? And what's exciting to you in the laundromat space? Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the most exciting things that's happening right now is that people are catching the vision of uh, running professional businesses, right? And it's not just because I think it's better business and people are going to make better money. But really, listen, laundromats, this is what I really love about laundromats besides the cash flow and all that stuff. What I really love about laundromats is laundromats are one of the last few community gathering points, right? The communities see each other, they cross paths, they hang out as their laundry is being done, you know, at laundromats. And so really this is a service to communities, right? And so when you have a laundromat that's dirty, it's unsafe, half the machines don't work, you're just communicating to that community that they don't matter. Like I, I I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Right. That's like, that's what you're saying to that community is you don't matter. And uh, you know, that's a tough message for a lot of laundromat owners, but I think it's one that needs to be said because when you come in and you take care of your business and you take care of your customers, you're communicating like, Hey, you matter, you have value, you have worth. And laundromat owners have this opportunity to, to do that and to serve these communities. So I love the fact that the business is being professionalized. I know we have a long way to go in terms of, you know, rehabbing our reputation, 
uh, in the industry, but I think the ball is rolling. People are catching that vision. And I love that, not just for the owners and investors, but for the communities that we're serving, because I think we have an opportunity to make a really big difference um, in our community. So, I mean, I'd say that's a lot of what I'm excited about. Some other things that I'm seeing happening is that a lot of laundromat uh, owners are starting to, a lot laundromats are starting to consolidate, right? Fewer owners are starting to own more laundromats. Again, the technology and all that stuff is contributing to that. Uh, but also more sophisticated investors, real estate investors, small business owners are coming into this industry um, and seeing the opportunities there to be able to scale out um, and own more locations, own bigger locations. And so that's pretty exciting to see also. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors. My friend Dave Zook says, you can be conventional or you can be wealthy. Pick one. At The Real Asset Investor, Dave and his team bring their investors high-yield investment opportunities across several asset classes for cash flow, tax impact, and equity growth. He and his team are one of the top five ATM operators in the country, and they have an investment opportunity available to accredited investors right now in the ATM space. To learn more about their ATM funds that produce tax-free cash flow, visit therealassetinvestor.com. That's therealassetinvestor.com. Awesome. Now, uh, I always ask my first time guests this question, if you cannot pass on any money to future generations, and you're mm -hmm. only allowed to pass on three principles to them to build wealth and achieve happiness and success, what would they be? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think first of all, I'd go right along the line. So I, I was trying to think about this and about what the things that I'm teaching my kids. Right. And so yeah. going right along with this is, you know, people matter. So treat people accordingly, right? Like treat people. And my mom used to tell me as when I was a kid, she would say, you know, just treat everybody like they're, they're special, right? Cause they are special. Right. And so yep. it sounds a little like happy sing songy, but it's true, right? Treat people you know, in that manner. And in fact, that is the best way to get people to respect and admire and trust you is to treat them like there's something important. So that's one thing. Um, another thing I tell my kids, you know, my kids are and not just my kids, me, everybody is like, you know, consuming all the time, right? Consuming content, consuming videos, podcasts, watching TikToks, all that stuff. And I tell my kids, don't be a a consumer only. It's not bad to consume. Don't be a consumer only, but yep. you also have to contribute, right? And so you have to contribute and whatever that looks like for you, you know, for me, that turned into starting Laundromat Resource and this platform and this community because I wanted to contribute, share the lessons that I've learned. For my daughter, she has a little YouTube channel that she's, you know, just trying out dancing and skits and playing with the dog like just she's trying to contribute she's trying to find her way she's nine right yeah and you know for my son he's got a little website that he's been working on he's trying to figure out ways to contribute so don't just consume you know contribute and then uh this summer actually just a couple of days ago we my family and i got back from you know an epic two-month trip in europe and one of the uh the mottos of our trip which i really like is do hard things for cool things. And it was when we wanted to go do something cool, but we were kind of tired and we just kind of rallied ourselves for do hard things for cool things. And I think it just, I think it expands to a lot of different things, right? A lot of yep. different areas of life, right? If you're, if you're trying to gain financial freedom through cash flow, right? You got to do some hard things in order to have that cool life on the, on the backside of it, right? To get that financial freedom. So do the hard things. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. Don't be afraid of failing. Don't be afraid of working hard, sweating, getting hurt, all those things. Uh, be, if you're doing it for, you know, kind of that, why that vision that you have of what your life would look like. And that's on the grand scheme of things, but also in the small, the small things, right? When you're tired after work and you've had a long day, and your kid comes up and says, hey, you know, can you play a game with me? And you really don't want to. But guess what? Those kids grow up real fast and they're not going to be asking you to play games with them for very long. So suck sure. it up and do the hard things for the cool things, because uh, those are the things that are going to matter. So do hard things for cool things. Awesome. I love that. 
Where can folks learn more about you and everything that you're involved in? You've got a ton of stuff. Uh, if you don't mind sharing where they can follow you and, and where they can reach out and stay informed of all the many things you're involved with. Yeah. So Laundromat Resource is so laundromatresource.com. That's the platform. There's a YouTube, there's a podcast. Uh, we, you know, we have a blog, all of that stuff. Um, you know, Jordan, J O R D A N at laundromatresource.com is my email address there. And, uh, you know, if there's somebody there, you know, who's listening, who's like, okay, listen, I think that this might be the way to go. I need to learn about this business. Um, we do have a course, how to buy your first laundromat in 90 days, um, that you can go check out. Uh, and I'll give you the link to that. So you can put it in the show notes or, or wherever you put a link. Yep. Um, I'll give that to you, but there's a ton of just free information out there, you know, at laundromatresource.com and all the platforms go, you know, consume all that, learn what you want to learn. And, uh, if you have questions, feel free to reach out Jordan at laundromatresource.com. Awesome. That course will be at cashflowninja.com forward slash laundromat. So I'll just keep it nice, nice and love simple it. for everyone. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Awesome. This has been great. Thank you so much, Jordan. I uh, really appreciate you coming on the show and connecting and sharing all of your knowledge uh, and insights on the laundromat uh, business and laundromat world. Really appreciate it. And you know what? It is my pleasure. And like I said, this is uh, a little bit surreal for me to, to be here chatting with you. I've been listening to your voice for a long time. So I appreciate you having me on. Huge honor. Thank you to all of our listeners and viewers for spending the most valuable resource or time once again with me. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. Until next time, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals. And you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.